Dr. Carey, are you uh, about ready to begin? Um, uh, yeah, sure. Great. We can go. Yeah, 11 o'clock. There we go. All right. Uh, I, I don't see any need to introduce you again, so please just take it away. Okay. So um, uh, I, I'm, I'm now getting, okay, good. Hello, everybody. So um, let's go ahead and get to that document that I failed to tee up properly before. And I will see if I can show you this fascinating sermon where um, Luther treats the gospel as a sacrament. Uh, that's not what I want. Nope. All right. I thought I had this teed up. Let me let me do this again. Um, whoop, whoop. All right. Because I know I have this set up where there it is. Okay. Um, uh, we all have to manage our um, our technology here. Let's see. Ah, there it is. Good. Nope, nope, that's not it either. Sorry. All right. Everybody will be patient with me, I hope. Um, it is um, Gospel of Sacrament. Da, 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 da. Oh, no. Why, am, why are we not getting this? Um, once again, I'm having. Um, bu, bu, bu. Um, I am not. Oh, there it is. There we go. Good. All right. So this is a sermon um, on Christmas Day, 1519. Um, I didn't find it, but it, 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 well, it hadn't been translated yet uh, when I was working on it um, a decade ago. So I translated it myself. Um, it only got discovered in, 18, in the 1880s uh, in a set of um, handwritten sermon notes uh, by someone who was in the audience at the time. So this is Christmas in 1519. The text is Matthew 1, 1, the book of the birth of Jesus Christ. Um, this birth is what we are to speak of, says Luther. But here at the beginning, I will point out that we must treat the whole life of Christ, all of Christ's deeds in two ways as sacrament and example. Now, that's a distinction that goes back to Augustine, um, as I, I think I mentioned in the footnote. Um, it's, no, oh, no, yes, uh, on the Trinity. Um, Luther will pick up this distinction. Later, he will make it into the distinction between gift and example, uh, especially in his brief instruction on what to look for and expect in the Gospels. That's um, a text that I've included in the four excerpts from the Gospel that I circulated with you folks. So sacrament and example becomes, in a couple of years, gift and example. Because what does a sacrament do? It, it gives you the gift. So when you're meditating on the Gospels, um, don't just take Christ as an example to follow, take Christ as a sacrament and a gift. Uh, I should mention this sermon is preached in Latin, so it's probably being preached to monks at the monastery, which is why he's going to talk about sacramental meditation on the text. When he preaches to lay people, he's going to focus on the notion of preaching and hearing the gospel preached. But for these monks, uh, still in 1519, Luther's still a monk, uh, preaching to the monks uh, sometimes, and he's uh, focusing on um, this literate uh, approach to the gospel where you're meditating on, on the gospel in two ways. Christ is an example, but lots of people are examples. Uh, there's other saints like Peter, or Paul, or John. They're examples too. Is Christ no better than them? Of course he's better than them, better in every way. What's the difference? Christ alone is the sacrament. So at the bottom here, but from Christ, you seek not only an example, but at the same time, the virtue itself, not just an example of a virtue, but of the virtue itself, righteousness itself, justice itself. That is to say, Christ not only presents the appearance of virtue to be imitated, but transfuses or infuses the virtue itself into human beings, into men. Um, again, whenever you see men here, it's going to be um, human beings, uh, homo in Latin. And the humility of Christ, that's another virtue, becomes our humility becomes ours in our own breast. Now that is what I meant by sacramentally, as opposed to an example, which is to say, and here's the, the key point now, all the gospel stories are sacraments of a sort, that is sacred signs through which God brings about in those who believe whatever the story designates. 
Um, he, he's not, he says sacraments of a sort because he's not proposing that we add to the list of seven sacraments or three sacraments or two sacraments or however, number you, however many you number them. They're sacraments of a sort. That is to say, they function the same way sacraments do. They give what they signify. So what, the reason why this is, I think, important conceptually is that Luther had first thought about the notion of the gospel as a promise. Now he's expanding it. The gospel is a story. The story contains promises. It contains the, the promises of Christ, but it contains all of these things that Christ has done. And these things that Christ has done should not be taken first and foremost as examples to imitate. First and foremost, they're things that he intends to give to you. Um, so let's say just a little bit more about that. The birth of Jesus Christ. These words are a kind of sacrament, says Luther, through which if anyone believed we're born again, by the way, the, the pronouns are shifting around a bit because this is taken down live, right? Um, we have these notes, probably somebody was right there writing it down as he was saying it. So these words are a kind of sacrament through which if anyone believes we are born again, born in Christ, that's his birth. That's, see, his birth is for our birth. His birth makes us born again. So just as baptism is a kind of sacrament through which God makes a person new and as absolution, that is penance, is a sacrament to which God removes sins. So the words of Christ are sacraments through which he works our salvation. Thus the gospel is to be regarded sacramentally. That is the words of Christ are to be meditated on, meditated on as symbols through which is given that same righteousness, virtue and, and salvation, which the words themselves set forth. Let me skip down a bit about this. Um, um, yes, he's thinking um, uh, about why Christ comes in his humanity Christ is, come forth, is, is to be set forth as the one to come to give us salvation and grace. And I say this especially to worried consciences, people who are terrified by their sins. Um, if Christ comes as a baby, you don't have to be so afraid. Um, but what you need to do um, is say this. This is, um, I should have crossed out that T, but he breaks into German at that point. Mother, this baby is mine, right? Um, so, Early on, he says, that is, if I hear the story of Christ and don't think that it at all pertains to me, so that it's for me that Christ is born and suffered and died, then the preaching or knowledge of the story or the history isn't worth a thing, right? Um, you, you deny faith. No matter how sweet or good Christ is, he is not recognized. He will not cheer us up unless I believe that to me, he is sweet and good. Unless I say, as if it were to, to Mary herself, mother, this baby is mine too. Um, so all of what Christ deeds, all of his actions, all of his power and glory are meant to be given to us. Um, and that's why we come, oh, look, there is Christ in the cradle, in the arms of this girl, this youngster, a maiden. What's lovelier than a child? What's gentler than a girl? What's nicer than a sweet young maiden? Look at this ignorant child. All these things pertain to him, lest your conscience be terrified. This bouncing baby boy, right? Don't be afraid. Look how God lures you in. He sets forth a child to whom you may flee. Right? This is why I think Luther just loves Christmas, right? He's, he's terrified of God most of the time, but here's this baby boy. And take a hold of this baby boy, make him yours, and all things, all, all gifts of God belong to you because they belong to Christ. So you can't be afraid to approach this baby boy because nothing is more lovable to us. You're afraid, but just do it. Just flee to this child there in the arms of this sweet, lovely girl. That's how great the goodness of God is. Um, so um, the idea here is that by believing in the gospel, we receive Christ and all that he does and is and has. And that's where I want to now shift to um, the freedom of a Christian again. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen. By the way, all these uh, documents have been shared with you um, uh, by email uh, if you registered for the conference. Now let me um, go, we're gonna do a, another share screen and we're gonna go back to the freedom of a Christian. Um, I need, there we are, okay. Luther on the gospel. So, this is the text we've visited twice already before because it's so important. And first he was talking about how the promises of God give what the commandments of God require, what I call the Lutheran codicil to the Augustinian heritage. Second, there's 
trusting that God is true, even if every man is a liar, including my own heart, my own deceitful heart, but God's promise is true. Then there's the third incomparable benefit of faith here. It unites the soul with Christ as a bride is united with her bridegroom. So the third incomparable benefit of faith is union with Christ. By this mystery, as the apostle teaches, Christ and the soul become one flesh. And if they're one flesh and there is between them a true marriage, indeed the most perfect of all marriages, since human marriages are but poor examples of this one true marriage, it follows that everything they have is held in common, the good as well as the evil. So here's the second step in Luther's account of salvation. First, it's union with Christ. That's where it all begins. That's the first thing that happens. Then there's what Luther will call the wondrous exchange. Because we are the bride married to this bridegroom, and we are the bride with nothing but sins to give our bridegroom, and our bridegroom has nothing but glory and righteousness and mercy and truth to give to us, we're going to have this bargain, this exchange. He's going to give us all of, our, uh, all of his wealth and glory and goodness and mercy. We're going to give him all of our sins. And he'll take our sins and kill them on the cross. And we get his righteousness and glory. So here's how Luther puts it. Accordingly, the believing soul can boast of and glory in whatever Christ has, as though it were its own. And whatever the soul has, Christ claims as his own. That's that exchange. Let us compare these and we'll see inestimable benefit, benefits. Christ is full of grace and life and salvation. The soul is full of sins and death and damnation. Let now faith come between them, right? Faith alone. And sin and death and damnation, and damnation, <laughs> sin and death and damnation will be Christ's, while grace and life and salvation will be the soul's. So you have union with Christ, this blessed marriage, and then this exchange where all the good stuff comes to us, all the bad stuff comes to Christ. Then there is a third thing that happens, um, a blessed struggle and victory and salvation and redemption, a mighty duel that happens on the cross where Christ defeats sin and death and the devil. Um, and I'll, 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 the, the theme of the mighty duel is wonderful. Um, you know, he gets our sins and what does he do with them? He, he destroys them on the cross. But let me go now back to the issue of justification or salvation for us. And I think there's, there's three steps in it. Um, and we've just encountered the first two. Um, and then I wanna add a third. So step one, and the foundation of everything else. By faith alone, we are in union with Christ, like a, a bride and his bridegroom. Um, faith says, I am my beloved's and he is mine. Right? This is my bridegroom. Secondly, faith receives not just who Christ is in union with Christ, but what Christ has, his righteousness, his justice, his mercy, his truth, his salvation, his glory, all the good things that belong to Christ by his very nature are shared with us because he is our bridegroom and, our, and the bridegroom shares everything with his bride. Um, and the, he also takes on all her liabilities and sins. So that's the exchange. So that's step two. Step one, union with Christ. Step two, the wondrous exchange. Step three, uh, is often put first, but I think it's, it's the third step and it's the least important. It's the non-imputation of sins. Um, the non-imputation of sins. That's what is needed because we're still imperfect. We're still imperfect. We're on the road. We're not, we're, we're not there yet. Um, and so th therefore God does not count our sins against us. And Luther will say this over and over again. And by the way, this part comes straight from Augustine. It's not new with Luther. Augustine says, look, when you're on the road, you're imperfect. He says this very explicitly, Augustine does, 1,200 years before Luther. We're on the road, we're imperfect, but God doesn't count our sins against us. Luther picks that up and says, yes. Right? The bride, bridegroom does not count the sins of the bride against her. So that's the three steps. Union with Christ, the wondrous exchange, the non-imputation of sins. Later Protestants take that notion of imputation and, and go much further with it and you have the imputation of Christ's merits to the believer. That becomes central to um, the Calvinist tradition, reform tradition, um, and to the later Lutheran tradition. And some uh, later Lutheran theologians make it the basis of everything else. But I'm suggesting it's, it's third, it's not the basis. The basis is union with Christ. Um, so here's a way of thinking about it. Imagine once again, you're building a house and the house is half built. So it's a house, but it's not yet a house. 
right? It's a house I'm building, but I don't yet have a house. What do you do with this house that's imperfect? How do you live in a house that's imperfect? Well, you're gonna put a tarp over it to protect it from the rain, right? That's my image, and it's my image for this non-imputation of sins. God is not gonna look at this imperfect house and say, well, that's a lousy house. What, what kind of house is that? We'll just knock it down and destroy it, right? Well, a ruined house might look the same way as a half-built house does, but the half-built house is on the right track, right? And so you protect it. You don't tear it down. God is not gonna tear us down. God is going to protect us and not count our sins and failures against us because we're on the road. So that's the third thing. It's, it's important because we are imperfect and we need this non-imputation of sins, but it's not the basis of everything else. So in my view, and again, this is my kind of heresy as a Luther scholar, um, I, I might, by the way, where I'm not a confessional Lutheran, I'm an Anglican, so I get to be a heretic about Luther scholarship. Um, my heresy here is, is that um, Luther's doctrine of justification is not fundamentally about imputation or reckoning or declaring us righteous. Luther's doctrine of justification is fundamentally about uniting us with Christ in the depths of our heart so that our hearts may be reformed in the image of Christ and all the good things in Christ may become ours uh, through faith alone. Um, so that's, uh, that's, mm, that's why I, I mentioned um, in response to, I think Kenneth, Kenneth Tanner's question, um, is there a notion of deification here? Yes, there is. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that as we go. Um, what happens in union with Christ is we are deified. Ah, as a matter of fact, let's look at a text that will help us with that. Um, and now I will share a different screen. Um, Christmas, ah, right. So this is another Christmas sermon. This is 1514. Um, so this is one of the earliest texts we have from Luther. And um, it's before he gets into this really um, vicious self-hatred penitential sort of thing. And he's hitting on basic patristic themes going back to, well, all the way back to Irenaeus. Um, I'm, um, this is from my own notes, so it's a bit rough um, because I, these are my, my research notes. But look at this second, um, this, this main, uh, really first main section of, of the uh, text. I've got it in Latin and now I, I have a translation. Um, so here uh, we have the translation beginning like this. Now we come to ethics. Now that's fascinating, right? This is about um, ethics or mores in Latin, if you see it there. Um, so this is about the ethics of, of Christ, the Christian life. The ethics of the Christian life is deification for Luther. Um, so this is why um, this sanctification justification distinction doesn't work. Justification is ethics. Justification is transformation. Justification is how we live by faith alone. So now we come to ethics and we teach first that just as the word of God became flesh, that's of course John 1, 14, it certainly must be that flesh become word. For the word became flesh, and that I've, these are my boldings because it's so important, for the word became flesh so that the flesh might become word. Our flesh might become the word of God. God became man, God became human so that man might become God. That's a famous formula. Um, it goes back to Athanasius and Irenaeus. Uh, they call it the exchange formula. It's a formula for deification. God became human so that human beings might become deified. Uh, let, let's say just a little bit about how he spells that out. The strong one became weak. Oh, I can actually highlight this for you. Yay. The strong one became weak. That's the word of God. So that weakness might become strong. He put on our form and figure and image and likeness so that he could put on us his image and form and likeness. So here's where I'm going to pick up this notion of being formed in Christ. Right? He puts on our form, right? Being in the form of God, he did not think equality with God to be something to grab at, but he put on the form of a servant. He put on our form, the human form, in order to put on us his image and form and likeness so that we may be formed in his likeness. Likewise, picking up on 1 Corinthians, the wisdom of God became foolish so that foolishness might become wise, our foolishness. And so it is with everything else that is in God and us, 
he assumed everything of ours and conferred on us everything of his. There's that exchange formula, that wondrous exchange. He gets all the sins and the death and suffering. We get all the glory and life and forgiveness and reconciliation. Okay, um, let's go on to the next section, more about formation. So here's uh, the Latin and now there's my translation. We are made word or word-like, that is truthful. Uh, the Latin is verbo similes, like the word. We're made into the word or word-like, truthful. Right? Just as he has made man or man-like, that is like sinners and liars, but not a sinner and liar. He's only like us. He's not uh, one of us sinners, but he is one of us human beings, of course. Just as we are not, and then he wants this second uh, bit, just as we are not made God or truth, because we can't be the eternal God, right? We have a beginning in, uh, in time, so we cannot become the uncreated God. We, be, we are deified by grace and not by nature, as the church fathers say. So just as we are not made God or truth, but godlike and truthful, or to quote uh, 2 Peter 1.4, we become sharers in the divine nature, when we assume the word and cling to him by faith. And that italicized bit that I'll just underline, that italicized bit gives you that, the, again, the theme of faith, which for Luther is always at the, at the heart of this. We assume the word and cling to him by faith. The word assumes uh, human nature, and we assume the word by faith. So in the incarnation, the eternal word assumes human nature. In faith, the human nature assumes the word. Um, we don't become the eternal word because we are not eternal. We, we have a beginning in time, but we, uh, we take on all sorts of qualities that belong to the word, justice, glory, salvation. Um, I'll say maybe one more thing about that, because this is deeply grounded, of course, in the doctrine of incarnation, which, in, in a, which I just find wonderful. Um, so let's, let's, this is sort of Luther doing patristics, uh, which is really quite lovely. Um, the word did not become flesh by deserting itself and being changed into flesh. Right? This is you know, Augustine and the whole, all the whole church father tradition. They say, look, the incarnation is not God changing into us because God doesn't change. So the word does not become flesh by deserting itself and being changed into flesh, but by assuming and uniting flesh to itself. Right? So that's the language that the church fathers like to use. The word assumes our flesh, unites our flesh to itself. By this union, it is not merely said to have flesh, but to be flesh. Thus, those who are flesh, that is us, are not made word, right? We're not changed into God, right? By being changed substantially into the word. And what he means by that is we're not changed into God. You can't be changed into the unchanging God. It doesn't work that way. Rather, but by assuming and uniting him to ourselves by faith. There's that, that keynote. And by this union, we are said not merely to have, but to be the word. We become Christ's. Um, German works that, that way, by the way. You know, when, when you are, become a Christian, you become a Christ. Right? So um, here's my comment on it, and then, and then we'll, we'll quit on this passage. Uh, so the union goes both ways. God becomes man, human being, as the word becomes flesh, without ceasing to be God. And we become gods, small g, as our flesh assumes the word without ceasing to be human flesh, being united to Christ by faith. In both cases, the causal efficacy the, the, is, is that of communicatio iriumatum. Well, that's a technicality I'll, I'll leave aside for a bit. It's, it's basically the divine and the human interact in Christ in a way that, that sanctifies and, and transforms the human. Um, uh, God remains God, but we become deified. God becomes human so that humans may become God. That's the basis of Luther's thinking about salvation, I think. Um, and always has been. Union with Christ is where it begins and where all the power flows out from. Um, let me say one more thing about that formation. Yes. Um, and Nick, we are going until when now? Help me out here, Nick. When are we going till? Give me just a moment. I'm pulling it up. Yeah. Um, so uh, closing devotions or, or the closing noonday prayer is supposed to begin at 1215. So- uh, Oh, we've got time. All right, good, good. All right, so let's go back to this um, exchange formula. 
right? God becomes human so that we can become deified. Um, Christ is our bridegroom giving us all that is his, right? The bridegroom gives the bride, first of all, himself, but then all his property, all that belongs to him. And that means we are formed in the image of Christ. We are changed deeply within. And that's why I keep saying that alien righteousness that I talked about before, which means justitia alieni in Latin, the, the righteousness of another, that alien righteousness is, the, is not alien to us in the English sense of the word. It's the righteousness of Christ, which becomes our very own. That's the crucial thing, right? What faith does is it says, mother, this baby's mine too. Just as truly as he's, as he's yours, he is mine. His righteousness is mine. His life is mine. His doing and suffering belong to me. Why? Why could I dare to say such a thing? Well, because he promised. And faith believes the promise. And faith won't call him a liar. So if he says that he is mine, if my beloved says he is mine, well, who am I to say otherwise? So I'll believe him. So he belongs to me. And all of his good stuff belongs to me. All of his righteousness and goodness. And that's the, the wonders of change. Now, how does that form us? is the next question. And that's going to be um, the topic that I'd like to spend some time on when we think about how Luther might be helping us today. Now, forming, we talk about Christian formation. That's a, an Aristotelian notion. Once again, Luther's constantly thinking like Aristotle, uh, much more than, than most scholars are willing to recognize, although recent scholarship is, is emphasizing this. We're constantly being formed. But how are we being formed? Um, now we can actually say a little bit about why Luther disagrees with Aristotle on a crucial, crucial point that he makes, he, he, he fusses about this a lot. He, he, he says, that Aristotle, that damned rascally pagan, he, he grumbles about Aristotle all the time. And it's almost always about this point. Aristotle asks, how do you become a good person? How do you become a just person? That's the question of justification, right? How do you become a just person? Aristotle says, well, by practicing just actions. By doing the right thing, you become the right kind of person. That's how you learn, by practice, right? Practice makes perfect. Uh, it's just like learning a skill. How do you become a good basketball player? You play a lot of basketball. How do you become a good musician? You play a lot of music. Uh, Aristotle himself uses the example of a flute player. How do you get to be good at flute playing? You practice, you do it. And eventually the doing becomes better and easier and becomes part of who you are. That's called, uh, Aristotle calls it a habitus, um, it's, it's a habit, but it's, it's an intelligent habit, like a skill, right? A skill has to be learned. You learn it by practice. It's not just mere rote habit. It's, it's the habit of um, Michael Jordan playing basketball. This guy knows how to play basketball. He understands basketball better than you and I do. Or Yo-Yo Ma playing the cello, right? Um, it's not just a, a, a rote habit. It, it's a habit that's tied to habits of perception, and action and understanding and intellect, and it's all tied together. And virtues like that too, says Aristotle. Virtue is, is a set of habits that are perceptive, intelligent, active, um, and by practice, we become eventually perfect or close to it. That's how you become a just person. C pretty much common sense, right? Practice makes perfect. That's an Aristotelian notion. You get better at it by practice, right? Luther bellows. Absolutely not. That idiot Aristotle, he doesn't understand the first thing about the grace of God, right? Um, um, Luther's a real huffer and puffer about things like this. Um, he actually says, now for civic righteousness, the kind of righteousness that Cicero is capable of as well as Christians, yeah, that's, that's okay. Aristotle's right about that. But righteousness before God? If, you, if, if practice made perfect in the righteousness before God, we wouldn't need Christ. Anathema it, forget it, no way. Aristotle, that rascally pagan, he has no idea about the grace of God because he doesn't know Christ. How could he possibly know the grace of God? So there is no righteousness for Christians apart from Christ, for heaven's sakes. So the formation of the soul is not formation by practice. It's not formation by doing stuff, right? It's not formation by good works. Good works don't form the soul for, for Luther. Or rather, they do form the soul, but not in any way that matters to God. Good works will form the soul in civic righteousness. Good works will form the soul in skills like basketball and music. But good works cannot form the soul in righteousness and salvation in God's sight. 
for that, you need to receive Jesus Christ. Duh, says Luther, we're Christians. How do you think this happens? It doesn't happen by us saving ourselves by our good works. That stupid Aristotle right, knows nothing about Christ and all those idiot theologians who, who want to be Aristotelian. So we need, we need a different account of Christian formation, not by works. And where are we going to get it from? <laughs> the, the funny thing is the conceptual apparatus for it will come from <clears throat> da, 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 Aristotle. Formation happens in an Aristotle, Aristotelian way for Luther, but not by practice, not by works, but by perception. Aristotle has a notion of perception, like seeing and hearing, that basically forms the soul. What we see forms our, our vision, what we hear forms our hearing, and they can get into our minds and our hearts and form us in our hearts. Let's use the, the kind of example that Luther loves to use. Um, not seeing, right? Luther is not a theologian of, of vision the way Augustine is. Luther is emphatically over and over again, a theologian of hearing. So let's talk about music. Music, music forms the soul, doesn't it? Music forms the heart, doesn't it? A favorite song is going to get etched into your heart and form your heart for the rest of your life. Right? Think about this. On the day of your death, you will probably be able to sing songs that you learned as a child, your favorite song. You will almost certainly be able to recite the Lord's Prayer because it's etched so deeply into your heart. Um, we learn the Lord's Prayer and the gospel in general. We learn it like a favorite song. That's how to think about Luther's notion of being formed in Christ. When we believe the gospel, it's like learning a favorite song. Uh, and again, the Lord's Prayer is probably the best example. It's so deeply etched in our hearts. Right? I have heard stories from a Lutheran pastor um, about someone literally on, on the, the day of their death, and they were praying the Lord's Prayer over this dying woman, and she pointed up to heaven. And she'd been non-responsive for days, but she, but the, the Lord's Prayer was still in her heart, like a favorite song, which she no doubt had learned when she was a, a, a tiny little kid. That prayer, the gospel contained in that prayer, the promises of God contained in that prayer were etched into her heart and carried her all the way to the doors of death. That's Christian formation in a Lutheran sense. That's how the gospel forms us. Because the gospel forms us by hearing and not by seeing. Uh, even if we happen to be meditating on a text, um, it's hearing and not seeing for a very, I think, fundamental epistemological reason. Um, when we see, we tend to think about seeing for ourselves. When we hear, we often hear things at second hand. So um, nowadays we can't see Jesus firsthand. We can maybe meditate on an icon, but you're not going to understand the icon of Jesus unless you, you have heard the story. What we hear is, is secondhand. We hear about stuff from people who've seen it. We hear about Christ from the witness of the apostles and from the, and the prophets, by the way. Isaiah also witnesses to Christ. Um, so we hear about Christ. And for Luther, that's good enough. Because what we hear includes the promise of God. And when we take hold of that promise by the hearing of faith, then then... It gives what it signifies. So the second hand aspect of hearing is good enough. Indeed, it's essential because by what makes uh, the gospel this in this second hand sense is we have to trust God to tell us who God is. We can't just see it for ourselves. Let me um, contrast two different ways of knowing that. And I think one is, is more visual and the other is more about hearing. Um, Imagine being in a math class. This, this is where we wanna see for ourselves, right? You might hear what the math teacher says and you believe what she says because she knows her stuff and you write down the formulas, but you don't quite understand them and you work at it and she helps you because she's a good teacher. And eventually you say, aha, aha, I, I get it now, I see it. And at that point, you don't need the teacher anymore because you see it for yourself. Lots of learning is like that. We wanna see it for ourselves. Um, Faith seeking understanding might work like that, uh, I think in Augustine. You begin by believing the teaching of the church and then you wanna understand it for yourself. You wanna to get to what uh, Thomas Aquinas calls beatific vision, 
You want to see you want to see God with your own mental eyes. Luther doesn't think like that. Luther's a theologian of hearing, and faith comes by hearing, um, as we all read in uh, Letters of Romans, chapter ten. Why does faith come by hearing? Because what we want to know is a person. And to know a person, it's different from seeing for yourself. You can't see into their hearts. You have to believe what they have to say for themselves. Um, now, maybe you can see through a liar. We sometimes can do that. But an honest person, a good person, someone like God, is someone we're only going to know if we believe what this person has to say for himself. We're not going to know Christ unless we believe his word. We're not going to know God unless we believe what God has to say for, for himself in scripture. So Luther is a theologian of hearing, um, partly because I think he probably was nearsighted and, and he loved music, but mainly because he, he thinks of God as, as a person. And you can't know a person just by looking at them. you got to hear what they have to say for themselves. They have the authority to tell you who they are. This is true of every person. This is one of the reasons why um, you can't know people just by, by doing research. You have to listen to them. I think this is a, a terribly important when we think about things like social justice. You have to listen to the people that you're working with if you're going to understand them and serve them properly and help them properly. Um, and that means you take this word in, in you and it changes you. The hearing of the word changes you. The hearing of the word of the poor changes people who haven't heard it before. Uh, but the hearing of a favorite song changes you over the course of many, many years. Um, this is why we keep repeating this stuff in the liturgy. We keep singing Christmas carols every year. Um, it was fascinating for me, the experience of, of singing O Come All Ye Faithful for the first time one December. And for the first time in, in 30 years, I was weeping. This, this, this song that I've been singing for, for 30, well, actually by then, I've been singing it for 45 years by then. And all of a sudden I'm breaking down weeping. Why? Because it has become a favorite song. And that song containing the gospel gives me my Lord, my, my bridegroom, my Christ. That's how Luther's thinking about this. Um, you can see how it works as a form of formation. And the crucial thing is to, to take that second step. Luther says, this is ethics. This is, this is Christian life. This is how you live as a Christian, is constantly taking in that word and being reformed over and over again in the image of Christ as these gospel words get etched deeper and deeper into your heart. Um, so that, you know, for all of us, I think, uh, on the day of our death, if we're at all conscious, we will have the Lord's prayer in our hearts. And perhaps, oh, come all ye faithful, and probably a, uh, quite a bit of liturgy, right? and qu probably quite a bit of, of um, the scriptures. That's the task of the church for Luther, is to give that word to people so that the word may be etched more deeply in their hearts. And by being etched in their hearts, the gospel is giving them nothing less than the form of Christ. So, um, so there's the last step. And then maybe we can have some uh, thinking about what's going on today. Yes. Okay. Luther loves the passage in Galatians where Paul talks about, um, in Christ I begot you so that Christ might be formed in you. Uh, Paul uses that language. I think it's Galatians 5. Um, I don't have the passage at my fingertips. Um, that Christ be formed in you, says Paul in Galatians 5, I think. Um, that Now, form. <laughs> Once again, we have to think like Aristotle. Aristotle contrasts form and matter, not form and content. That's a modern contrast. The Aristotelian contrast is form and matter. And the reality of the thing is the form, right? Moderns tend to think the form is external and, and a mere shell, the content is the real thing. But Aristotelians think the other way around. The form is the real thing. The form is what makes something what it is, right? So, um, Oh, I, let's think about the form of music again. Think of the form of um, a favorite song. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Uh, maybe that's your favorite song, but certainly it's familiar, right? Um, now that form can be embodied in various kinds of matter. 
uh, when I sing it in this room where I am, it's in sound waves. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. But it gets to you through, um, uh, I guess, electric waves. Um, is it le electrical pulses? Or it could be light pulses if it's uh, optical cable. Um, and of course, it can be also be recorded. It will be recorded. So the form of it will be um, um, on a hard drive or a thumb drive or a server somewhere. The same form, but different material, right? Because the reality of the song is the form. It, 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 it's properly embodied in sound, but the form can also be captured on tape or a hard drive or electrical pulses. Same form, same song, because the reality of the song is the form. So the reality of Christ is his form, which we get to share. When the gospel becomes our favorite song, um, the form of Christ is in us. That's how, it, uh, how Luther's thinking. And the reason why it's a process is because the formation of anything is a process. The house has to be built. It takes time. Christians have to be made by the hearing of the gospel. It takes time. Um, that's what the church is for. All that preaching, all that liturgy, all that music, all that teaching, all that reciting of Psalms. Um, it's to etch that stuff more and more deeply in your heart. So you become like, um, <laughs> to use my favorite example of mine, you become like a CD that can play Mozart for heaven's sakes, right? Um, my heart is not good enough musically to play Mozart, but I've got some CDs that can do it. And yes, right? Imagine your heart becomes like a recording device that can play Christ. Um, and in your life, right? Just as you can probably sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, and certainly you can say the Lord's Prayer just like that, right? At the drop of a hat. You can also play Christ and you'll get better at it as you go. That's Christian formation. And that's the process of justification. It's also the process of sanctification. Those are, those are not two different processes for Luther. It's also therefore the work of the Holy Spirit who's taking that word, that music of Christ and reshaping our hearts more and more deeply in the image of Christ through the power of the word because the Holy Spirit is in the business of making Christians over the long haul, like building that house. And that's, um, that's what the church has to give to the world, is to give the world Christ through the gospel. Now, I'll say just a little bit about um, how that works, I think, in the contemporary context. But I think this is something that all of us have been thinking about, so I want to leave lots of time for that. Um, we're not in the 16th century anymore. There are some people who are terrified of, of hell still. Um, most of them are not in our neck of the woods. We're on the East Coast. If you want to find people who are afraid of going to hell, go to the Midwest or the South. They're, they're still there. Um, they're still around, and you can find them. Uh, many of them are called evangelicals. Um, but everybody, I think, can, can suffer certain kinds of performance anxiety. Am I good enough? Um, uh, if God really looked at me, what would God say about me? Um, I, your life is a wreck. Why would I want you, right? We all have that kind of fear. Um, my, one of the deep fears of my life is what, what would happen if instead of saying, well done, good and faithful servant, God would look at me at the judgment day and say, man, eh, I gave you so many gifts and, and talents and abilities and look what, look what crap you made out of them. Um, you know, one can be afraid of that kind of thing. One can be afraid that one has, rest, has wasted one's life. Um, the judgment of God is a terrifying thing one way or another. So, but that's um, the thinking that still exists within what I'll call Christendom. Christendom being a label for the cultural alliance between Christianity and culture and often between Christianity and politics, which has been so characteristic of the Western tradition until recently. Um, Western Europe is really no longer Christendom. Germany isn't, England isn't. Our part of the United States is no longer Christendom. You can still find Christendom in places in Iowa and in Louisiana, but not around Virginia and Washington DC and Philadelphia, not really, right? Uh, there's lots of Christians, of course, but the point is that the culture is not explicitly Christian. Being Christian is not the respectable thing to be. Um, in, in large parts of, of the East Coast, to be Christian is to be quite unrespectable. 
Uh, you have all sorts of awful ideas about, I don't know, things like abortion maybe or, or sex or, or, or marriage or something. Um, so you're, you're not really ex acceptable as a Christian, at least not in the respectable way that it used to be and still is in some places, I think, in the Midwest, say, where a respectable person is a respectable Christian. You could talk about a Christian gentleman in Louisiana not too long ago. Not anymore. So this is what I mean by saying um, we are um, we, we're in a post-Christian setting, right? Um, we are no longer Christendom. So what has to happen, I think, is that the church has to do the same thing it always does, but in a different setting. It has to preach Christ. It has to form souls in the image of Christ. And instead of, of offering people ways of, of not going to hell, um, the, the task is, I think, to offer them the beauty of Christ, uh, to, to, to be aware of the deep beauty of what God has done to, for us by giving us this beloved, this bridegroom. And that's where meditating on icons might help or meditating on Western crucifixion paintings or meditating on a, cru a crucifix or meditating on Mozart's grand mass in C minor, which is one of my favorites or meditating on a Bach cantata um, and learning to sing this stuff is, is really helpful. Um, those things will help form things. And the target really has to be that I think the beauty of God in Christ Jesus but that of course radiates all over the place. It, it includes the beauty of, of God in the face of our children and the beauty of God in the resilience of the poor and the beauty of God in a fragile climate that is being threatened by our stupidity. Um, all that I think we can preach. Um, maybe let me say, yes, oh, one more thing. Um, I do think there's something really worth leaving behind in the old preaching of terror. Uh, Luther thought that, you know, if people weren't terrified, you should terrify them a bit by preaching the law, right? Just like Augustine said, preach the law a bit. Um, and it probably would be good if we had a bit more of the fear of God in our hearts. But one thing we shouldn't do, um, and I think this is one of the things that evangelicals are, are tangled up in and having trouble with, it won't work to preach the gospel by saying essentially, if you don't believe my gospel, you go to hell, right? If you don't believe the gospel, you go to hell. That's preaching the gospel by threatening people. And that ends up becoming a form of coercion, right? Threats are coercion, right? Your money or your life, right? You know, yeah, give me your money or I shoot you, right? Uh, believe the gospel or you go to hell. Right? That way of preaching is not worthy of the gospel. And of course, you know, rational people who have integrity will say, what, you're gonna threaten me into believing what you believe? Uh-uh, right? That's not worthy of my belief. I'm not gonna believe just because you're trying to threaten me with, with the wrath of God. So um, I think we do need to focus on the beauty of God. Um, now there is a wrath of God and there's things to talk about there, but I think that understanding of what it means to be facing the judgment of God and his wrath is more accessible once you're inside the church now than when you're outside the church. People outside the church don't understand that. And I don't think that's the thing to preach them. Uh, show them the beauty of God. And then you learn about your sins later. Right? This is very different from the 16th century. Um, I think Christians nowadays, uh, excepting some evangelicals, we learn about our sins after we learn that God loves us. And that's a better way to learn about it, I think. Um, and then we learn to be penitents after we've heard the gospel and learn um, that, that God forgives sins. We learn to become sinners. Um, actually, um, Luther does say that we learn spiritually to become sinners. I think we do need to learn that. That's why we have Advent and Lent and practices of penance. So uh, part of learning the beauty of God is learning that we are sinners. Um, but that becomes a safe thing to do rather than an emotionally devastating thing to do once we're firmly grounded in the gospel. And I think that's important in, in preaching in, in the world after Christendom. Um, Okay, I, th there was a question about what to do about um, the things that, that uh, Luther and Augustine did wrong. L let me start with that and then we'll go from there. Um, there was a question about um, what do you do about Luther and the Jews, for instance? Uh, and because Luther, what Luther says about the Jews is absolutely inexcusable. It is wicked. Um, I think Luther um, is the only great theologian of the Christian tradition that I know of who wrote stuff that was just positively wicked. So that's, that's a funny thing to say about my favorite Christian theologian, 
right? Luther's my favorite theologian in the tradition, and I think he wrote stuff that was wicked about the Jews. So it, it's part of being a grown up is that you have to read like a grown up and realize Luther at his best is wonderful, and Luther at his worst is frankly wicked. Um, he has no right to say the stuff he says about the Jews. He did quite literally uh, urge that uh, Jewish worship should be made into a capital crime in Germany, um, that, that Jews should be executed for praying or, 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 or worshiping like Jews. That's just wrong. Um, briefly, I, I'll, I'll diagnose this problem this way. Luther gave up hope for the conversion and um, for, for the faith of, his, of all of his opponents. He didn't hope for the conversion of Catholics. He didn't hope for the conversion of those idiot reformed people down there in Switzerland with Zwingli. He didn't uh, hope for the conversion of the Jews. Um, I think Christian hope has to be essential to how Christians relate to everybody else. And it's not necessarily a hope for their conversion. It is a hope that with the right mixture of repentance on maybe both sides, um, but especially Christian repentance when it comes to our relationship with the Jews, with the right mixture of repentance and listening carefully, um, what we can do with the people that have been our enemies or to whom we've been enemies, what we can do is hope for good from them and for them. Right? Hope means hoping for the good, both hoping to do good and hoping to receive good, hoping for the good of the Jews and hoping to receive good things from the Jews. And the wonderful thing is that that's already happening. I mean, Christians are learning so much about exegesis from Jewish exegesis. And the Jews have been, I think, so incredibly generous to Christians um, in forgiving our past offenses against them. We have so many good things to receive from the Jews. Why should we not hope for the best for them too uh, and their particular kind of faithfulness to God? So hope for good things for them, hope for good things from them. That's, I think, when that's firmly established, you don't fall into the, the great evil of, of Luther's writing against the Jews. Um, uh, there was something about Augustine and women. I think Augustine was actually um, one of the, the, the best ancient men to write about women. Um, I'll say something very briefly about that. He lived with one woman for 15 years. Um, in his later writings, he classified that kind of relationship as a marriage and said that a man who, who abandons such a relationship commits adultery against the woman he's been with. Um, and um, when he sent her away as a young man, it was a sin. He was very, very clear on this. She promised, um, she, she made a vow not to see, not to know another man, which made, when, when Augustine writes this in the Confessions, he's saying, look, this woman whom I love, and I sent away out of sinful ambition because I was gonna marry somebody richer. Uh, he couldn't really marry her because she was lower class. It was actually illegal for him to marry her. Uh, and she couldn't be an, a, a mother of, his, of an heir, um, but he, he nonetheless kept the child that they had together and educated him. Um, uh, but meanwhile, he, he'd been planning to marry a rich Christian heiress. Uh, marriage was a, a form of social advancement and social climbing. And he, he, he clearly thinks he sinned against this woman by sending her away. She promised, uh, made a vow never to, to know another man, which is to say she could be chaste. Uh, she had chastity. Augustine, after sending her away, couldn't wait for the, the, the marriage with the Christian heiress, which was gonna take a while to arrange. So he had took another, another concubine um, simply to satisfy his sexual urges. And Augustine, the bishop writing about this is just terribly humiliated and embarrassed. And he's saying, she was a better Christian than I was. I think uh, consistently, I think he honors her as a better Christian than himself. I think consistently he honors his mother uh, as a better Christian than himself. So I think Augustine, um, Augustine's record on, on women and the Jews, by the way, also is really quite good. Um, there's a book on Augustine and the Jews by Paula Fredrickson, which um, Fredrickson is a, a, a former Christian, now a Jew, who's just astonished by, um, by, by Augustine's positive relationship uh, to the Jews and his positive theology of Judaism. So Augustine comes out, I think, really quite well. Uh, Augustine is, is a man of patience and wisdom and intelligence, and his theology isn't as good as Luther's at his best, but what can you do? Um, Luther at his worst is just awful, and Augustine, I think, even at his worst is not awful.
Thank you, Dr. Carey. Uh, your first question comes uh, from Pastor Lou Florio, who says, um, uh, what you shared as one of your heresies about Luther, that our union with Christ and ongoing formation is more important than non-imputation of sin, echoes what I understood from reading Mink Hoffman's book, and I probably mispronounced that, Theology of the Heart, the Role of Mysticism in the Theology of Martin Luther, and uh, the uh, Theologia Germanica. Ah, okay. And he asks, uh, have you written books or do you know of any books to recommend where we might read further along this, quote, heretical line of thinking? Uh, Lou says, I find this an, an area where Luther is very Catholic and likely a fruitful ecumenical area to wrestle with. Right. OK, yes. No, this is interesting. Um, about 20 years ago, there was, there was a lot of work on Luther's mysticism. Um, uh, Stephen Osment, uh, who's a student of Heiko Oberman, wrote about this. Um, and Luther's mysticism or his, or his engagement with the German writings on mysticism, including a man named Tauler, who's a German mystic, probably Luther's favorite German writer, um, picked up on a lot of those, those um, um, patristic themes, right? God became human so humans could become divine. I think that becomes the the kind of framework within which he reads uh, late medieval mysticism. Um, but he's also reading it in this penitential light and, and you get some of this kind of self-hatred stuff that also shows up. Um, and I myself uh, don't wanna go as far as, as people like Meister Eckhart. Um, I, uh, there's something that I, I wanna sort of dig in my heels there. So the direction I wanna go in myself is more in the patristic direction, more in with Athanasius and Augustine. And the people who do that, interestingly, are a bunch of Finnish scholars. There's a whole tradition of scholarship in Finland going back to um, a man named um, uh, Manerma. Uh, there's a bunch of them. You can get a good introduction to it in a book called, I think the title is Union with Christ. It's edited by Robert Jensen and um, Carl Broughton. It uh, contains essays from um, a pro-ecclesia conference about 15 years ago, maybe, uh, on this Finnish scholarship um, on, on Luther. And what the Finns, the Finns are a fascinating bunch because they have lots and lots of Eastern Orthodox on their borders with uh, Russia and um, their, their, their culture is Lutheran. So they're thinking a lot about Lutheran Orthodox dialogue. Now they have the Lutheran Catholic dialogue, but they began with Lutheran Orthodox dialogue. It's always safer for Protestants dialoguing with Orthodox than with Catholics. They don't have to give up quite so much. It's, it, but at any rate, so Protestants can, can dialogue better with Orthodox and the Finnish really knew how to do it. And they picked up on the Eastern Orthodox notion of deification. And they said, oh, union with Christ and Luther looks a lot like that. Um, so um, the introductory volume, Union with Christ, I think is Jensen and Broughton. Um, and there's a whole bunch more and I could, I could give you a, a bit of, of bibliography on that um, if I look at my notes. Um, so I think that tr Finnish tradition of Luther scholarship is really, really good. And, and I think they, they, they hit the nail on the head. Um, I do a little of that stuff in my book on the meaning of Protestant theology as well. And uh, some of the bibliography is there. Great, thank you. Uh, your next question uh, is, is charity deficient if one hopes for the temporal good of the other only and not the eternal good also? Right, um, yes, I think that's right. Um, charity, um, of course, is, is, is an old, old word, and it, it designates the love of God and neighbor, right? The love that obeys the command to love God with your whole heart, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And I think to, uh, to, to have charity in its fullness, you have to want for your neighbor what you want for yourself, because I think that's what it means ultimately to love God. I'm sorry, to love your neighbor as yourself. And this, by the way, is an Augustinian interpretation of charity. It's, it's really quite standard. Um, to love your neighbor as yourself is to want the good for your neighbor that you want for yourself. And what good sh should you want for yourself? You should want nothing less than the best. You should want the supreme good. You should want God who is the supreme good, eternal beauty and, and uh, unchanging truth and the glory of God. You should want that. That's, your, that's what charity desires. That's the desire you should cultivate. And you should want that same desire for everyone else. Um, that means I think um, ultimately, we should hope for the salvation of lots of people who have never 
um, became explicit Christians in their lives, maybe have never heard the gospel. Uh, we should hope for the salvation of Jewish folks whose fidelity to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, includes not becoming Christians. Um, I think there's there's a complicated situation there, but I think partly because Christians have tried to make Jews into Christians by persecuting them, Jewish faithfulness to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ often means not becoming Christians. And I think those that faithfulness is something for which we could still hope for the salvation of their of their and their eternal life. So yes, um, charity is deficient unless it wants eternal life for for those you love. We still have time for more questions if anyone wants to type in a question. Um, while folks are doing that, I have, I have a really quick one, Dr. Carey, and that is um, there's been a, you know, several books that have come out in the past few decades about being Christian in a, in a post-Christian world. I think of uh, Hauerwas and Willimon's Resident Aliens or more recently uh, The Benedict Option. Uh, and uh, I wonder um, how you see what you're proposing as, uh, you know, being in conversation with those texts. Yes, um, I've learned a fair amount by reading Hauerwas. Um, I think he gives some really good orientation to our post-Christian setting, right? Um, post-Christian setting is not the same as a as a um, uh, as a pagan pagan setting. It's it's. And, and Robert Jensen also is thinking about this post-Christian setting. Um, uh, Willimon's work, I don't know myself, but um, my own graduate training uh, was influenced a great deal by George Lindbeck. Um, here's something, what I learned from Lindbeck, which I think resonates very nicely with, with what people are learning from Harawas. Lindbeck said that in our post-Christian setting, the church needs to learn some of the skills that that Jews have always had to have in Western culture. The church is a certain instantiation of Israel, the beloved people of God. They don't replace the carnal Israel that is the, the Jewish people. And there's a complicated theology about post supersessionism on that point. But, Lu but Lindbeck was suggesting that Israel, carnal Israel, the Jewish people um, have learned the skills of being a, a cognitive minority in a culture that is at best indifferent and sometimes quite hostile, right? There are, there are things you do as a community, liturgically, congregationally, in helping one another to maintain that communal identity, which is the identity of the people of God. And Christians can learn from Jews something about how to do that. We're going to have to learn from Jews about how to do that because um, we no longer have control of the culture. Um, it's no longer quite so respectable to be Christian. And uh, Hauerwas, of course, thinks that that may be a good thing for us. Um, um, it does mean that we will lose certain kinds of power. Uh, for, for those of us who are academics, it means that um, there aren't going to be a lot of, of uh, places to study theology because, you know, good academic places to study theology require money. Um, and in pro ecclesia, I'm, I'm working with lots and lots of young scholars who are teaching at tiny little Christian colleges and teaching four courses a semester because, you know, you don't have, you know, theology is not a respectable discipline anymore. Um, Yale was one of the last places where theology was a respectable discipline in the, in the university. Um, I'm thinking again of, of my predecessor, Robert Jensen. This is a man who, who's I think the, the, the greatest American theologian since Jonathan Edwards, he should have been teaching at a place like Princeton, but um, he was at Princeton and they didn't make a pro him a, a professor at Princeton because he wasn't respectable enough. He was, I think, too Christian. Um, so, you know, there, there's losses and I'm, I'm gonna be grieving some of those losses. I'm gonna be grieving uh, the, the, the weakness of, of academic theology, but overall, it's probably a good thing that um, we're losing Christendom and we're gonna to have to learn how to be Christian in a non-Christian setting or a post-Christian setting. And we're gonna to have to learn how to, to do catechesis and how to do Christian formation um, in this setting that, that where the culture doesn't help us out with that. And the academy doesn't help us out very much with that. 
Um, so the church had better be serious about, um, well, Christian formation within the church because the academy is not going to do it for us. Now, now I speak as Protestant. I realize, oh yes, I have Catholics um, in in the audience. The, the Catholic university system is is it, it's there and it actually supports theology. Um, there's also also sorts of conflicts about it as well. But um, there, there is a, a, a you know, <laughs> I will say when I have students in my little Protestant uh, college who want to study, uh, uh, get a PhD in, in theology, the first places I think of sending them to are, are Catholic universities, which are being very, very hospitable to Protestants who want to study the great tradition and the church fathers and even the Reformation. Um, so that's good. That's good. I, the, the, the Catholic Church has all sorts of institutional strength that um, the Protestant churches don't have anymore. Um, and so the Catholic Church is going to have a particular role in strengthening the, the cultural survival of Christian, Christianity in, in a culture that's no longer supporting Christianity. Uh, the Protestant churches, I think, have a different kind of role there. And, and that's one of the reasons why Protestants and Catholics need to be working together on this. I, I expect to be spending sending more of my students to, to Catholic universities for PhDs in the future. Well, I, I, I see uh, commendations, but but no uh, no no questions yet. <clears throat> when you posted the Union with Christ book, yeah, that's. That's, I think, the first book to go to if you want to explore this Finnish um, approach to um, to Luther. Yep. Yeah. Um, and thank you for all the the words of encouragement, folks. That's that's really kind of you. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah. Teachers and pastors both know how important it is to to occasionally get some positive feedback. <laughs> um, you know, you pastors, you have a hard road to hoe because. Um, um, you, so much of your teaching is, is preaching. Um, I get to teach seminars much of the time, right? And in seminars, I get to interact with students and I get to see their reaction and I get to see how what I'm saying lands and they sometimes even smile at me, which is really nice. You pastors, you have to preach to an audience that, that doesn't get to talk back to you. And I think that's, that's a real, that, that's really hard. I, I would find it hard to do that every Sunday. So more power to you. Thank you for doing that. And yeah, let's, let's make sure to encourage each other. Thanks. So two questions have come in. The first is, uh, what are your favorite books on formation and discipleship in this view of salvation? Uh, and then another one is, uh, can you comment on the Jewishness of Jesus? Whoa, okay. Um, yeah. Let, let's start with the Jewishness of Jesus and then go to, um, to books. Um, yes, um, Fascinating. Early in Luther's career, he wrote a really good book about the Jews. Uh, it called the, "The Jesus Christ Was Born a Jew." Um, you know, Jesus. It, of course, Jesus wasn't just born a Jew. I mean, we Christians, we we believe that the, the man who sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, is a Jew. He's still a Jew. He didn't stop being a Jew. Um, um, and Luther said this this lovely stuff. You know, um, how did he put it? Um, the Jews are the natural born brothers and sisters of Jesus, right? We Gentiles, you know, we're only adopted into the family. And, um, you know, I wouldn't, if I was a Jew, I wouldn't stand to be a Christian because Christians behave like such pigs. Um, <laughs> he, he, ins he insulted uh, Christians rather than Jews in that text. It's, it's really quite, quite lovely. Um, uh, Jesus is a Jew. Uh, he still is a Jew. Um, our God is a Jewish man. I mean, um, that has enormous consequences. Um, it means that um, the, the people that I call carnal Israel, right, are carnal in the sense that their flesh is, 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 the, is the body of, of God in, in a way. Michael Wishagrod writes about this, um, the Jewish writer. Um, the embodied presence of God prior to Christ was the Jewish people, and still is, um, because Christ individual human body is a Jewish body. And it's, it's a concentration of, of God's presence um, in the carnal people of Israel, the flesh of Israel. Um, and that flesh, um, hmm, let me put it this way. This is uh, extending the point just a bit. Um, it's a good thing for Christians that there are Jews. 
right? It is a good, the Jews are chosen for the blessing of all nations, as we know, going back to Genesis 12 with Abraham. And that's still the truth. And Christians should hope for, for blessing from the Jews and should be a blessing to the Jews. I think that's what Romans 11 is ultimately about. Um, Gentile Christians have the task of being a blessing to the Jews. We've done a really lousy job of it over the past 2000 years, but that's our task. And that means it's a good thing for Christians that there are Jews. Um, we expect our blessing from them. We, we, we need to be blessing them. It needs to, be, needs to be a kind of economy of mutual blessing as my colleague Kendall Solon puts it. Um, and and that, um, that mutual blessing is, um, ah, it means we should be thankful to God that there are Jews in the world. And when that's part of our heart in a deep way, then the Jews don't have to worry about Christian persecution anymore. Right? Not just tolerance, but to, to be glad that there are Jews in the world and to talk about that and so that the Jews overhear it, that will reassure Jewish folks that Christians are not gonna break out into persecution anytime soon if we make that part of our hearts. Yeah. Oh, and then there's the thing about uh, books about Christian formation. Um, I'm gonna have to think about that because I'm, 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 I have a book contract to write such a book uh, next year uh, on my sabbatical. Um, and I, hmm, what would be the best Christian formation books to do? Um, my own experience is I, I just read as much Christian literature as possible. And um, I find some of it beautiful and some of it boring and I stick with the beautiful stuff. Um, who, what, what to recommend? Um, I know that there's, there's stuff that I've read like this, but I, wow, I mean, for me, I think the thing that formed me the most besides uh, Luther and Augustine um, was Bach and Mozart. Um, I, I, in Palestrina, um, I learned to sing Palestrina masses in, in choir in, in the university. And um, that helped me more than anything, I think, um, in my Christian life. But, um, so, so um, oh, Renaissance motets. Uh, Renaissance, they're, they're wonderful. Um, so I would recommend those. Um, uh, Howard West is good. Um, not as good as Mozart, but, but good. Um, uh, but I, I will have to think about that because um, I, I should probably have a bibliography of that for the, for the book. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Carey. I think we'll go ahead and, and end it there uh, because we have uh, our closing noonday prayer scheduled in just a couple minutes uh, at quarter after. So um, again, uh, Zoom doesn't really make it uh, you know, easy to uh, give our applause, but um, we are applauding. You can see, I think. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you.